So many of you have been to the Aru Goat Farm. And some of you were at the beginning and you saw as it grew and you saw that we just came to a nothing area and it's just emerged into this beautiful oasis that's being built from the, the edge of the desert exile, just barren nothingness into a spiritual, beautiful center for all nations. And, um, you know, in light of the walk of Abraham, I just want to share you my testimony and Tehillah's testimony to the guidance that we all have access to in our lives if we're open to it. And it's not always going to be easy, but we have two options in life. At the end, we're all gonna die. So there's like tragedy at the end here. So we can choose which adventure we want. We can live a guided life. And perhaps that covenant and commitment will push us through, not only reveal who we are, but really be an arc in these challenging times. And we can just choose to sort of like let the chaos of life thrust us in different directions, try to outthink the universe and strategize our plans. But I think the Torah is teaching us, you want to be blessed? Just follow your flow and be guided by God. And so um, here's the story. You know, when I first came out to the mountain, there was really nothing there. There was no power line. There was no water infrastructure. There wasn't a single tree. You know, now we have 4,000 fruit trees, vineyards and grapes that have been harvested now. At that time, um, there was just nothing there. It's like at the edge of the desert. I was sent by the municipality to help these two Israeli families who just tried building a farm. It's the most strategic location in that part of Judea. And one of the most challenging locations topographically, geographically, it's like, it's like desert, unproductive, thorny, rocky terrain. And at that time, it was almost five years ago, I became very close with one of the most beautiful Christian organizations in Israel called Hayuvel. And they bring Christian volunteers to help Israeli farmers in Judea and Samaria. And I was told to go help these farmers in Judea. And to me, that was an easy mitzvah. I'm just, farmers need help? Hey, I know this organization that helps farmers. I'm just going to introduce the head of that organization and to these farmers. And I've done my good deed for the day. Excellent. So Friday morning, I go out to the farm to meet these farmers and introduce them to Tommy Waller and his family at Hayovel. And they start talking and they, they're just, you know, and I just start walking around the mountain. And in my life, I've just never had the overwhelming experience that I had when I arrived in those mountains of King David. I didn't know that those were the mountains of King David. I didn't know that's where the book of Psalms was written. I just sensed something so much larger than myself, the Shekhinah, the divine presence. I don't know what else to describe it. And I just never in my life, the beauty, the views, the rocks, the cliffs, the valleys, it was like looking at just something was like my soul just left my body and spun around and just went into the soil there, into the rocks. And it was like my soul had found its home. I was being called to go there. And since that day, it was, I, not a day has gone by. If I was in the land of Israel, I was on that mountain. Every single day I would go there. My soul was like stuck in those rocks. I had to go there and like visit my soul because I was over there and I was in the Daniel. And just every day, I just kept on going for two years. I did whatever I could to help build. I gave all of my money that we had to this place. I gave, brought groups there, friends there, tried to bring other, just did whatever I could. That was my mission. I was being called to help build the ruins of Judea and great and at one point, I just stopped going to synagogue in the morning. I just drove out to the mountains and I started praying my morning prayers there. And that's where all of my music came from, just being in the mountains, singing my praises to God and melodies came to me. And I would drive out to the mountain and then pray and then go to Jerusalem and go to work. And it was just like, that was my routine every day, just on the mountain, just praying there, walking there. It was a love affair with the land. And I never had such a thing before in my life. You know, my grandfather, he walked from Russia to Israel in the early 1900s, 1916, when he was only 15 years old. He was born in Bialystok as a teenager. He left to return to the land of Israel. It took him a year and a half to walk across Europe. And when he arrived in Israel for the first couple of years, he joined a kibbutz and planted eucalyptus trees all around the Sea of Galilee. And at that time, the northern part of Israel, the Galilee was just covered in swamps. And today, when you go to the Galilee, of course, it's one of the most beautiful places in Israel, but you can see these marvelous 100-year-old eucalyptus trees all around the area. And so my family, we take great pride in knowing that my grandfather had a hand in planting those trees, in draining those swamps, and making the land beautiful again of the first pioneers to really fulfill that vision of the prophets. And so I came out to these mountains, 
And then I saw these two Jews, they started to plant trees at the edge of the desert. And it touched my heart so much. It's like, what? You can be a pioneer in 2020? Like, you can do that today? I mean, it's just like connected so deeply to me. It connected me to my grandfather that I never got to meet, but I grew up on his stories in Atlanta, Georgia. It like, in some ways, it connected me all the way back to Abraham. His original mission was to come to this land, make it flourish, make it blossom, build a kingdom, light up the world. And I was like, I knew that I was supposed to build this farm, but I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how far that calling would really take me. I'm, I'm doing everything that I can within the realms of logic. I mean, we were so comfortable in our home. Our kids were settled, stable, good routine, healthy environment. We lived in a beautiful community named Neve Daniel. And my brother was my next door neighbor, his kids, my kids. We were just all together. I was a settler living in the West Bank, settling the land. I mean, all my boxes were checked, but the farm just was calling me. And I didn't know what to do with that. It's like the deepest settlement in Judea, the newest settlement, the most strategic. King David's mountains are calling. And I'm like, whoa, what do I do? What, should I move there? I mean, sell my home and throw all of our lives into this mission? I mean, that's just like a little bit too much for me. It's not like I'm a businessman. It's like a rabbi. Like, this is all that I have is my home. It's like, what if like the government or the Supreme Court destroy my home? What if Barack Obama does a two-state solution and destroys everything that I'm building? I mean, this was in the middle of like a very scary, unpredictable time. It's like, what about my security there? Like the army, it's like, I'm alone on a mountain. Like, what will my children do alone on a mountain? Uh, will they be happy? Like my marriage? What happens if I fight with Tehila? I mean, we'll be alone. I won't have any friends. It'll just be me and her fighting on a mountain. Like the financial risk, the security, the politics, is just too much unknown for me. I just could not make that leap of faith. And so it's okay. You know, we'll just continue to do everything we can to help push the project forward. And then a spice cart came, just like dropped out of the sky. And it was, uh, this is now over like three years ago. And this happened on the day before Rosh Hashanah, the day before the new year, before the, the, the day of creation in the biblical calendar. Teal and I went to an evening Saturday night, Rosh Hashanah was Sunday. And it was like an evening to prepare for the, you know, for the, for the great day. It's like, you know, it's, we're going to spend two days in synagogue. Let's make sure that these days are special, like meaningful. And so that night, begins and it was beautiful. There's Torah and music and prayer and worship and meditation and learning, just like as beautiful of a preparation as could be. And at one point in the evening, the rabbi taught this beautiful idea. He said, right now in the biblical calendar, this is the day before creation. This is the moment before let there be light. It's like, this is the time when God was still dreaming of what he wanted the world to be before he created it. And this is the most opportune time of the year to dream about what you want for this coming year because Hashem is literally dreaming with you. And so now try to dream, try to envision your year. And, and Elul, we, we really envisioned that quite well. And then he started to play music and he's guiding us with questions to try to create this image in our mind. You know, he's like, where are you? And who's with you? And what people matter to you most? And what are you doing? And, you know, put some color to it. And slowly but surely, I'm like creating an image in my mind. And I start dreaming about the farm. And we had a house on the mountain alone and our children were running through the grass and people were coming from all over the world to learn Torah and play music and pray and be close to the land and close to nature. It's like our home was open to all these guests and we we're hosting them for Shabbat. And the, just the mountains of Judea was like such a beautiful dream. And so, okay, amazing night. We, we go back home and, you know, the kids are already asleep. I'm lying in bed with Tehillah and she turns over to me and she says, so Jeremy, what did you dream about? And I told her, oh, Hamuda, I had the most amazing dream. We were, you know, on a mountain in our home. And it was, you know, people from all over the world were coming. And I told her the whole dream. And she stops. And she gets like a little bit nervous. And she gives me this face. I'm like, oh, I've done something wrong. I've done something stupid. I know that face. And she jumps out of bed, barges into the baby room. And... I mean, books are falling off the shelf. The baby was crying. It's like, well, something's going on here. And she comes back into them. She's like, I know that dream. She opens up this notebook and throws it on my bed. And it was her diary. Tia has been keeping a diary since she was like six years old. And I've never read her diaries. I don't know anything about this entry. And so I curiously open up this notebook and I start reading. It says, it's my 18th birthday. And I just had the most powerful dream. 
Now understand, I only met Tehillah when she was 19. So I didn't even know her when she had this dream. And I don't know what to do with this. She continues to write. I'm living alone on a mountain with my husband and children. And my children are running through the grass. And people from all over the world are coming to learn about the land of Israel and how beautiful the Torah is. And I'm like reading this dream and I am stunned, dumbfounded. I don't know what to do with this. I keep on reading at the end of the dream. She writes like this. I don't know how I'm going to get there. I'm going to need a partner to help me. But I believe with all my heart that this is what God has for me in my life. Well, at that point, I feel like I kind of lost my free will. Like, what was I going to do with that? I mean, I was almost 40. This is the diary of an 18-year-old little girl that was written, sealed, lost on a shelf, forgotten about for 20 years. Tehillah became a lawyer. All of a sudden, we're married. We got children, and I'm, I, I'm encountering this reality. What is going on here? Our lives went in a totally different direction. And just now, as we're struggling to make sense out of life, this farm, what are we supposed to do? We're confronted with this dream that God gave to Hila before we even knew each other, weaving our lives together and guiding us in the most mysterious way. It's like, what do we do now? Every logical reason told me to stay in my place, close to my relatives, in our comfort zone with everything that I knew. But I couldn't live my life with that question hovering over me. I made a commitment a long time ago to go with God. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we're not going to follow our dreams? Like, that would be the biggest regret of my life. I just couldn't live with that kind of regret, knowing, like, what's going to happen if I just live my life my whole life? I'm like, oh, my God, what would have happened if we would have followed our dreams? Who knows what light we could have brought into the world? Who knows what position that we could have attained? Who knows what, 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 what marvelous things could have unfolded? And it's like, how many dreams did Joseph have that directed his life? Just, just a couple. It's like, how many times did God speak to Abraham? It's like, just a few. It's like, what if, what if I don't follow this path I'm being led down? And we don't get any more dreams. So Tila and I decided that we're all in. We just, you know, it says like, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your might. And Tila and I said, that's it. We are in with all our heart, with all of our soul. The might is not a good translation there. Meodecha means in all of your very. <laughs> and so there's like 5,000 interpretations of what that word means, might. Meodecha, your very. What does it mean? Love God with your very. So it's your money, your family, your time, your possessions. So it's just like endless. And I think the answer is yes, all of them. To love God with everything you got, all of your very. And we said, how many times in our life will we be able to love God with everything we got? We're just going to sell our home. We're going to sell our stuff, give away whatever we don't need. And we're being led down this path and we're going for it. And I had learned a lot of Tanakh then. And I had felt in my own way that I was living as guided as I possibly could, as aligned as possibly as I know how. I didn't know what the future would help, but I was walking in the desert of the unknown, but I knew that I would be blessed or so I thought. And I can't tell you how hard the move was for me. I have to keep my beard as relatively uh, short because it's so white. I became white over that half a year. Um, my brother was so upset with me for breaking the family apart. My parents weren't very happy at the financial irresponsibility of the move. To heal his parents, oh my goodness, moving out to the eastern mountains, the deepest settlement in Judea, I might as well have moved to Afghanistan. I mean, people were trying to convince me to, 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 to take my house off the market, and I said, I know what I need to know. And all I know is what I understand, and I'm not backing down. And so as soon as we sold our home, and we were all in, and there's no turning back, oh God, all hell broke loose. The flood came and it swept me away. I mean, you want to talk about famine, Egypt, whatever you want. All of those analogies came true in my life. We were in the middle of building our staff house on the farm. And we started construction in the house of prayer and our retreat center that would serve as an experiential Torah study center for the world. Three European countries woke up all of a sudden and sued us in the Israeli Supreme Court to destroy everything we had built. It was four Jewish families, like my little children, or like on the front lines, like linebackers, holding on, holding on to the land of Israel, blocking these three dangerous European countries, meddling in our country's business. You could imagine, I'm like terrified. 
like, wow, I sold my home, my only asset, my life savings. I'm going to be homeless. I'm going to be penniless. All of my years of effort are all going to be destroyed by these foreign countries obsessed with Jews not living in Judea. I just couldn't think, couldn't help the irony of that. These European countries calling a Jew in Judea an occupying settler, colonizing a foreign land, while they're funding these left-wing radical organizations to colonize our Jewish country for their own European agenda. The hypocrisy of it all. This makes your blood boil. And so here I am fighting off three European countries like me and Noam and Emma and my children against three countries. And at the same time, a commitment that was made to complete our center wasn't followed through. Half of it was made and half of it wasn't. And all of a sudden, I'm now in debt with our contractor, hundreds of thousands of shekels. It's like, what? <laughs> I'm a teacher. I'm not a gambling guy. I don't go into debt in the bank ever. It's like, and all of a sudden, I found my ministry in like hundreds of thousands of shekels in debt in a legal case in the Supreme Court to destroy my home and everything we had built over the years. I had to vacate my house in a few weeks and I had no idea where I was going to go. The contractor who was building all of the buildings on the property demanded payment, rightfully so. And he said, if I don't get the money promised to me, I'm stopping all building right now. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't stop the building of my house. I mean, I have six children. I can pay for my staff house because I sold my house. Please don't stop that construction. And he's like, if I don't get paid, I'm out. And you know what? I didn't have a house. <laughs> I'm wandering through the desert of Israel with six kids. I'm a week in Ashkelon. I'm a week in Tiberias. I'm a week in my parents' house, a week at her parents' house. And of course, all along, we told you not to do it. Why did you do this? What have you done to your killed children? <laughs> what have you done to your family? Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I'm homeless. I don't know what's happening here. And so we're just from city to city trying to figure out what to do. We finally moved into our home. It's a total disaster. The construction's unfinished. We didn't even have a toilet. We didn't have a kitchen. <laughs> we had a compost toilet outside with six kids. I don't know if everyone here knows what a compost toilet is, but it's, I mean, just to make it sound just real, it's like just a bucket that you poop in and then you throw wood chips on the bucket. That's what we had as a toilet outside our house. So it's six kids with a compost toilet. It's like on the, the, on the compost toilet, off the compost toilet. I'm going to try to get to bus on time and school started. Just absolutely chaotic as I'm trying to get out of debt and meet with lawyers about our case in the Supreme Court. I just... Falling apart, I think, is probably the best way to describe me. And you should know, the entire time, as I'm just like sucking my thumb and crying myself to sleep, Tehillah never once even complained. She was like, this is the adventure of a lifetime. We're never going to regret this. This is amazing. <laughs> compost toilets, they're so ecological. I love them. We should have compost toilets in our house. I'm like, what? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> We're going to have regular toilets in our house. And she's just a hero, period. She just, I mean, maybe she didn't have to deal with the wrath of the contractor in the Supreme Court, but moving six kids to a mountains, it was superhuman. And her faith gave her superhuman strength. And clearly, I had jumped way beyond my faith grade. I mean, I maybe I was like a yellow belt and I like leaped for a black belt. And it was just, it overwhelmed me. And so here we are, like, what have I done? What have I done? I had such a good life. Why did I do this? I'm following my dreams. Who do I think I am? Joseph? Like, following my dreams. I'm like a crazy man. A crazy man following my dreams alone on a mountain. It's like night after night. I'm just stressed beyond pushing, pushed beyond anything that I had known before. I mean, just, I was just, at nighttime, just cry myself to sleep. You know, just like, what, what have I done to myself? What have I done to my life? You know, I didn't hear from God on the ark and Abraham didn't hear God on his journey. And let me tell you, I was all alone on a mountain and it felt like I was literally up against the European Union. The whole world was against me. There was no inspiration. There was no communication. I just wanted God to show me the way. And I felt like I was abandoned. It's like, was all of this just a coincidence? There's no word for coincidence in Hebrew. What is this? The pain and the suffering and the anxiety. It was insane. But what I didn't know was that Hashem was just teaching me to walk. Maybe that I would be able to teach others how to walk. Giving me strength and a well to draw courage from the next time I see a challenge in my life. I suffered a lot during those six months. I wasn't always so great. <laughs> that year made me grow up and it grew me in the spiritual and it grew me in the emotional. And looking back, if I had to be honest, 
I really made myself suffer. You know, I, if I just had faith, I just couldn't see a way through it all. But God had a way. I put myself through a living hell, worrying about what would be, worrying about the future that never actually came. Abraham, following the guidance in his life, arrives in the land and almost starves to death. He's forced down to Egypt and almost loses his wife. That seems to be a blueprint. It's like if you go into the unknown, it's not just going to be like roses. You're going to encounter hardships. You're going to encounter challenges. It's like the Jews break away from Pharaoh in Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. They see the mightiest empire fall before them. They escape into the desert, but then they can't find water for three days. Three days without water, you're on your way to dehydration and death. It's like you break from inertia. You break from your own slavery. You go beyond yourself. You are going to be tested. You're going to be pushed to your limits, but stay strong. Those times are building you. Right now, all of us are going into the unknown. Who knows what's going to happen this week? <laughs> Big elections are at hand. And we all need to know that Hashem is guiding this ship. It's like, once I heard a righteous man say that faith is believing that everything will be okay. Trusting in God is acting like everything is okay already now. <laughs> so somehow... Groups came to the farm from all over the world. People from outside the country, literally from the ends of the earth, from Hong Kong, came in to our aid. Somehow we won the case in the Supreme Court. Just the impossible challenge and obstacles that seemed insurmountable. God had a way, a way that I could never have seen. And that's what Isaac's birth represents for Abraham. It's a way that we can't see. But if you live in a covenant, if you ask to fulfill your mission, it will be answered. That's the basic fundamentals of the Torah. If you are committed to God and committed to truth, believe me, it will come to pass. It might be hard. It might be a long road. There might not be communication, but ultimately the kingdom will be built. And here we are watching the kingdom being built before our very eyes. It's like now in hindsight, I realized that had we not moved, not only would the farm never be built, not only would this sacred place may have been lost to squatters. But I don't think this fellowship would have ever been established. We needed to be able to walk the walk of Abraham. We need to live as believers with our money, with our families, with our lives, to put our mouths in our lives and align them. We needed to be believers with Emuna in action in Judea to bring all the believers around together. And so God has led me and Ari and Tehillah all the way to this fellowship. We've come to the mountains where King David assembled his men, and a group of the most amazing, soulful people are assembling here. David and his men started off just a few hundred, but together they ultimately caught the heart of the nation, and they laid the foundations for Jerusalem. Somehow Hashem has brought this fellowship together from all over the world as an example for the world to see and for more to join. It's like we have one father, Abraham. We're one people, one tree of life, one heart one land, one God. It's like we are on such a beautiful journey together, a journey that Abraham started almost 4,000 years ago, and a journey that all of us in this fellowship are now marching down the final stretch. It's like as Jerusalem and Judea are being rebuilt before our eyes, it's like may Hashem continue to guide us in our lives. My name is Jeremy Gimpel, and I live here in the mountains of Judea. And in these unprecedented times, I wanted to offer you a gift from the land of Israel. We've been here at the cutting edge of the Jewish return to the land of Israel. We've come to the place where King David first assembled his men and where he wrote most of the book of Psalms. We are quite literally transforming this desert mountain area into a Garden of Eden-like oasis. Watching prophecy manifest into reality, we felt called to reach out to the nations, to teach them lessons from the Bible in the original Hebrew, unlocking insights and understandings that you can only get if you read the text in its original language and from a Judean perspective. The prophet Zechariah spoke of a time that 10 men from all the nations will grab hold of the corner of a garment of a Judean man and say, take us with you for we have heard that God is with you. Perhaps this is the time that the righteous among the nations will now make a sharp U-turn and reconnect to Israel, reconnect to Judea, reconnect to the Hebrew roots of the spiritual realities of this world. 
This is an invitation to join us at our next live gathering with hundreds of families from over 30 countries around the world. And if you register now, we'll give you a free gift from Israel, the first five sessions that unlock the secrets of the Hebrew Bible and how to live as a believer in these times. I hope to see you at the Land of Israel Fellowship. Shalom.